Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's Rugby Canada Law Implementation Guide webinar series where we will focus on World Rugby's measures to limit contact to the head. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be made available online for um, anyone to take a look at through our Rugby Canada channels. So we'll just get right into some of the content here. Start the, the purpose of why we're here today. So we'll take a look at, um, or we'll try to understand the basics, the key areas of focus, which uh, today will be measures to limit contact to the head. We'll also take a look at understanding the differences between community rugby and professional rugby in, in the video examples. We will take a look at uh, how we can implement the directives concerning dangerous tackles at the community level. And we will also look at how we can all work together to ensure that the welfare of our players is our primary concern. Those uh, last two or three points are obviously critical to making sure that we have safe playing environments for all of our players as our seasons start across the country here in 2017. So we'll get right into it. Here is World Rugby's actual release. Remember, this is their wording, not mine. And... For all intents and purposes, some of the language isn't entirely accurate. There is no actual change to the law. However, they are correct when they say that they have redefined uh, the categories and increased the sanctions within those categories. So just keep that in mind as we go through this. There is no actual change in the way the law itself is written. All right. And obviously the key here is the purpose behind which World Rugby decided to implement these measures and that is to lower um, the acceptable height of the tackle and we'll get into what that means in a moment. So here's our definition for an accidental tackle. We'll read this out. When making contact with another player during a tackle or attempted tackle or during other phases of the game, if a player makes accidental contact with an opponent's head either directly or where the tackle starts below the line of the shoulders, the player may be sanctioned. This includes situations where the ball carrier slips into the tackle. So we also have here what they described as a minimum penalty, uh, minimum sanction as a penalty. So when they say may be sanctioned, let's all be aware that as soon as there is contact to the head, we will have a penalty. Uh, there is the possibility that even with an accidental tackle, we still can have a yellow card or a red card. It just depends on the severity right? Contacts that start below the line of the shoulder and slide up will be a penalty. So let's take a look at an example here. And here's why we've made the decision where the tackler initially makes contact at the ball carrier's shoulders and the tackle slides up to the neck and head area. The example is pretty clear. Initially starts at the shoulder and moves up. Okay. Now we'll move on to our definition of a reckless tackle. So a player is deemed to have made reckless contact during a tackle or attempted tackle or during other phases of the game. If in making contact, the player knew or should have known that there was a risk of making contact with the head of an opponent, but did so anyway. This sanction applies even if the tackle starts below the line of the shoulders. This type of contact also applies to grabbing and rolling twisting around the head or neck area, even if the contact starts below the line of the shoulders. And we will take a look at a few of these examples, but remember that the key here is that the player knew or should have known that there was a risk. So this is a player responsibility to ensure that they are uh, aware of their responsibilities. So we'll take a look at a yellow card example and the logic behind this yellow card and not a red card is that the tackler initially makes contact around the head or neck so the first point of contact will be around the head or neck with moderate force and recklessness and we'll also take a look at the importance of that language in a moment. Up 
So again, that descriptor is relayed on the video. Pretty clear about first point of contact to the head or neck, and then that moderate force and recklessness as the criteria for a yellow card. Here in our red card example, all right, again, the descriptor, the tackler initially makes contact around the head and neck, so the first point of contact being up high over the line of the shoulders <clears throat> with substantial force and recklessness. So substantial being the keyword here. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. Right, so first point of contact above the head or neck, uh, sorry, above the line of the shoulders on the head or neck, and then substantial force and recklessness used in the follow through of the tackle. Okay. So let's take a look at what this means for us in the community part of the game. What we'll do is look at a couple of um, things to help officials out, as well as a couple of ideas and tips to help some coaches and players out as well. So one of the first things that uh, we can help ourselves on the refereeing side of things is putting ourselves in a good position to see the play, right? Starting on the attacking side, putting yourself in that good position to see the tackle unfold. And I like this example um, from a game, a first division game in BC, where the referee does well to get ball in line. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Good clear views of both tackle situations, both high tacklers playing good advantage. Again, getting himself ball in line. There we are. So what I wanted us to take from those examples is the ball in line running, um, not necessarily everything else that comes with um, how to deal with the tackle situation. That's not to say that there was anything wrong with how the referee handled the tackle situation here. What I am trying to solely get at is the positioning part in open play once the ball is from one phase to the next. So good ball in line running, easy to see the tackles, and he was right on top of all of those tackle situations. The other thing I want to make note is I'm trying to find as much local stuff that's as recent as possible to put on these webinars. This is from a game two weekends ago in BC. The next game is um, uh, two, last weekend and the weekend before and I can get to describing those a bit later. So that's the first piece, is just that positioning piece, really to help referees guide them through um, what that looks like from a, from a pos p position on the field to be able to see what's in front of you. The rest of the positioning obviously can be a point of discussion further on, but for the purpose of what we're trying to get at, ball in line running here from one face to the next is really well done and shows how significant it can be to making sure you see that whole tackle scenario as it starts to unfold. All right. So the next point is timing of the whistle. And that's not to say that there is bad or good times to blow the whistle. It entirely depends on the situation that's in front of you. Some instances will require you blow it right away. Some will allow you to play an advantage, especially depending on the level of competition, the discipline of the players in the game, the temperature of the game, as well as the potential to actually score off of it. So a couple of key points. If you are going to hammer on the whistle, give her a good blast when penalizing dangerous tackles, right? And I think the purpose behind that is to ensure that everyone knows that you have seen the incident, right? A lot of times flashpoints can arise because players aren't sure whether or not the referee is going to deal with it because they might not have seen it. A good quick whistle shows that. In addition, however, we'll take a look at some of the examples here because being vocal about having seen something and trying to play an advantage can be 
uh, good opportunity to allow play to continue. And again, that entirely depends on the situation in front of us. So we'll just run these through, and then we can have a quick chat. So in the first instance, it's unfortunate that the mic cuts out of the referee from time to time because all we hear is the whistle at the end and not the clear advantage communication. So it, it would have been nice to have that piece. However, advantage was signaled and, and verbalized early, which made sure that players were aware. And then here we have, um, in the second instance, you, we unfortunately don't have the referee mic'd up at all, but at the... Uh, just as the arm goes up, there is a, a very loud blast of the whistle that can be heard and players obviously realize this very quickly. So in both examples, I think we had a good um, identification of the actual incident. Each was handled differently. However, given the situations in front of them, that may have been the best method of dealing with it. What I don't want to do is overly complicate situations with processes, what I do want to do is make sure that everyone's able to read the game that's in front of them and handle it the way that is appropriate. One thing I will say is especially at the under 19 level in high schools, blasting on the whistle loud and early in a game can certainly benefit you from having to experience potentially um, dangerous situations or flashpoints. However, if a try is on, it might be a good opportunity to, to play some advantage. Right, so another point for referees to maybe take into consideration, time and space, right? So one of the things I like to talk uh, or mention is that whistle time is your time. So once time is off, give yourself the time that you need to be able to go through your processes and make your decisions, right? One of the things I want um, I would like us to notice in this clip as well is how calm the referee is, right? This is a player issue. They are responsible. It's not a referee issue. There is no need to stay um, or to sort of get emotionally involved in these decisions, right? So one of the things uh, we'll take a look at is this incident from last weekend's USA-Uruguay ARC game and have a quick chat about that as well. He now comes to help out. So we'll notice a very, very quick whistle. Time off very quickly. So it's a good piece there about um, taking the time that the referee needed to consult with his AR just to make sure that everyone's on the same page with what they've seen. There is no TMO at the ARC, which is why I felt this clip is still relevant, although, again, not every club game will have assistant referees. Um, I think it's important to notice the amount of time that the referee took to make um, sure that everyone was, was clear about what was going to happen next. That doesn't mean this was handled perfectly, and I think uh, we can maybe take a look at a couple of other um, changes, potentially staying over the scene a little bit more, having a bit more presence in the area before moving straight to the assistant referee, just making sure that players are moving back to their own goal lines, right? That'd certainly be one area. However, very calm player responsibility to make sure that their tackles are low and definitely took his time to make the decision. Okay, and the last piece I really want to touch on with officials in terms of some tips and tricks is to use really concise language and we refer to it sometimes as law speak, right? What is the language used in the laws, right? As we go through this clip, again, note, it might be tough to pick up, hopefully it's clear. Uh, however, once this is recorded, you can certainly take a look at it again. 
but the referee mentions the specific language of the law speak, right? So, and again, notice the calmness and the presence, especially of the official after the whistle goes. So as the referee handed out the red card before the replay, uh, sorry, yellow card before the replay, um, definitely mentioned the words reckless tackle to the um, player. And it's language that is going to be consistent for um, players as they go through uh, the season and coaches as well. Excellent. So just a few more tips and tricks prior to the game, just ensuring that both teams... Uh, coaches and captains are well aware of these new measures, as well as the law trials. We'll get to those tomorrow. Um, trust your processes on the field and focus uh, on the criteria for each sanction. This is important for the next term. So in a tackle situation that is reckless, we're automatically looking at either a yellow card or a red card. Okay, And if you as an official cannot talk yourself out of a red card, it must be given. So the point of um, discussion here would be, or to take home would be that if you go into the situation, take a look at it, start at the red card. The, the threshold is, is it reckless? Yes. Was it considerable force and recklessness? If so, it must be a red card. If you are clear and convinced that is moderate force and recklessness, yellow card would be an appropriate decision. So just keep that in mind. I think it's also the same when we're looking for the difference between a yellow card and a penalty kick, right? The penalty kick is very clear, needs to start below the line of the shoulders. The tackle needs to start below the line of the shoulders. As soon as it runs up over the shoulder, right, now we have a question of, okay, was the force and recklessness still, although it's not under a quote-unquote reckless tackle, it still could be accidental. If there is substantial force, Yellow card could be appropriate, right? So it just depends on the situation at hand. Okay. A couple of things, uh, some guidance for coaches. <clears throat> Chasing tacklers. So following the line break, um, these scenarios seem to increase the likelihood of poor tackle technique leading to sanctions. So there's a few clips here of where following line breaks, we had the person chasing the ball carrier come up high and we'll just take a look at what that looks like and it's just a trend I've, I've picked up over the course of the videos that we've taken a look at. Try and play this. There we go. So we'll see following line breaks, tacklers coming up high. So just something to be aware of as, um, as you go through your coaching, your players. A couple of other pieces. Just being up to speed with the new measures and law trials and open to dialogue with officials. Ensure players understand their responsibility for keeping the tackle safe. Again, officials are not responsible for what color card comes out, right? The criteria is dictated to them. And the actions of the players are the ones that put officials in a position to make these decisions. The other one, and I haven't found good quality uh, community video of the double tackle, but just be aware of the risk of it, especially if that second defender is going for the ball around the chest. And oftentimes that's because the first defender can alter the body position of that ball carrier. So if that second tackler comes in high, if that ball carrier was nudged lower by that initial contact with the first uh, tackler lower, that may uh, increase the risk of this second tackler coming up around the chest. Just be aware of that. And finally, use some available resources to develop proper tra tackle tracking and tackle technique. 
And so this is my plug for uh, Rugby Canada's PlaySmart program, as well as our Rugby Canada uh, National Key themes, which were put out by um, our coach development department. So all things that will help us um, get players better prepared over the course of preparations for the season to come out onto the field fully understanding their responsibility and having the skill set to be able to execute proper tackles. Finally, a few key points to keep in mind. We certainly don't have TMOs in domestic rugby competition. In fact, in some international competitions, as you saw with the America's Rugby Championship, we don't. All right, so this means that referees will have one look. And if they don't have assistant referees, they only have one set of eyes on it. Just something to be aware of. Most matches also do not have assistant referees, as mentioned. <clears throat> So this means that before anything else, every stakeholder in the game needs to be supportive of this initiative, understand the purpose behind it, and have empathy for the job the referee is trying to do. And I know that I'm, I'm, you know, development of match officials here at Rugby Canada, and it's not to say that referees need to be um, protected. However, it certainly is to say that unless everyone buys into what World Rugby is trying to do with these measures, um, the the, the fruits of the results might not be as positive as we would like. So if everyone buys in and if everyone is working towards the same goal, I think we're going to see a lot of success. And then finally, again, just to repeat that, players who put themselves in positions to tackle at the shoulders or above put themselves at risk of being sanctioned. Right? So just something to be aware of. So we'll take some time for questions. Please obviously feel free to fire me an email at any point. And I appreciate your time. Thank you again.